seated. This is, by the way, the one Sunday of the year where if you take a little nap, it's understandable. Uh, having lost an hour of sleep. Now, in case you haven't been following the South Dakota legislature, this whole problem could have been avoided. There was a bill put before the Senate to get us off of daylight savings time on a permanent basis, but it failed on a 17-13 vote. So if it was difficult for you to get up this morning, you might want to think about calling your local legislator. Hey guys, next year we can get this done. I want to tell you a little story this morning as we begin. It uh, was at the end of a kind of difficult, rancorous wedding rehearsal when the groom approached the pastor with an unusual offer. He took the preacher aside, and reached into his wallet, took out a $100 bill and held it to him, and he said, Pastor, I'll tell you what, let's you and I make a little deal here just between the two of us. Uh, this is yours if you will just remove the part of the vows that's promised to love, honor, and obey. And as long as we're at it, let's get rid of that part about being faithful to her forever. I'd just appreciate it. Maybe tomorrow we could leave that out. He extended the money and the pastor took it. On the day of the wedding, when it came time for the groom's vows, the pastor looked the young man in the eye and said, Will you promise to bow down before her, obey her every command and wish, serve her breakfast in bed every morning of her life, and swear eternally before God and your lovely wife that you will not even look at another woman as long as she lives? Encourage one another and all more as you see. 
see the day approaching. The Spirit gave these words to the Apostle so that we would understand that Jesus' sacrifice brought to an end division between humanity and God and between one another. That's in your message notes, and if you uh, hear nothing else this morning, hear that, please, and believe it. Understand it. Apply it to your life. This is so important and so essential. We do not want Jesus to have gone to the cross in vain, but instead we want to, by our choices, make his sacrifice even more effective. Now there's three things we need to learn about this passage. It, the first is that it refers to a curtain. And the curtain is a symbol of division. How many of you know what the Iron Curtain was? Raise your hand, don't be shy. You're not really that old. All right, how about the Steel Curtain for football fans? All right, you don't have to like it, you just have to know what it is, okay? These were symbols of division, weren't they? The Iron Curtain divided between the free world and the communist world. The Steel Curtain divided between the football offense and their goal line. And they were means of keeping people out. It showed a division. Well, there was a curtain that hung in the temple in Jerusalem. It hung between the holy part of the temple and the most holy part of the temple. In several of our Baptist churches, you will see baptistries that have a curtain across them. And that's not quite exactly the same thought, but it serves a different purpose, but you can visualize it that way. In one church I served, we had a curtain that went across the choir loft. So that if the choir members decided they needed to take a little nap during the message, they could get away with it. So curtains serve lots of different purposes, but the purpose of this one was to separate not just parts of the temple, but the contents of that most holy room. What was in it? If you're Raiders of the Lost Ark fans, you know exactly what was in there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was, to the people of Israel, a symbol of God's presence. And it was said to be the seat where God sat. Now, of course, God doesn't need a seat. He's not going to be in just one place at a time, but it's a symbol. It's sacred. And part of being sacred or holy means to be set apart. And so you didn't use the most holy room in the temple as a storeroom. You didn't go in there at all, as a matter of fact, except once a year. And only then, only the high priest would go behind the curtain. And they were so concerned about doing something wrong and God taking their life on the other side of the curtain, that the high priest would have a rope tied around him in case he died in there, then the priest on the outside could pull him out without going in. You didn't want to be the EMT asked to go in to the most holy place after the priest. So that, that was just, that wasn't anything they were commanded to do, that was something they decided to do. So part of holiness is separation, and that is a virtue, folks. There are things that, that are sacred because we set them apart from everyday usage. It's a good thing. Now, the instructions for the construction of the curtain are found in Exodus 26. And I want to point out that it was to be decorated with blue, scarlet, and purple threads. And the embroidery was to depict heavenly beings, angels, known as cherubim. The reason that's important will become clear later. That place was set aside by the presence of the curtain. God's holiness was realized by this symbol. But you know, we can take even symbols too far. And sometimes separation.
separation is not holiness anymore. It becomes simply division. And division between people is a vice. There must be some separation between us and God because God is holy and is in heaven. We are not perfect yet. We are not pure. We will be when we go to be with him in that place. So fullness of fellowship isn't quite possible in this life. So the separation between us and God emphasizes his glory and his holiness. But that can be taken too far and used as an excuse. And sometimes in a, well, all the time, in a spiritual sense, when we're separated from God, it's because we have disobeyed him. That sin has created a distance between us, a division. That's cured by forgiveness and by the blood of Jesus. But divisions also arise between people, don't they? I like to say if you're breathing, you'll have conflict. It happens. It's okay. We work through it and we stay together. Divisions arise between people when our desires are in competition. Divisions arise when we emphasize our differences and we ignore our similarities. Differences arise when one or the other or both of us is refusing to heed the voice of God. But in all relationships, whether it's your, you and me or us to each other or us and God, love is the cure. Love is what heals and repairs divisions. Now we're going to look uh, very briefly at the Gospel of Matthew and also if you're writing on your notes, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, and verse 38. And what we see happening here is that Jesus on the cross speaks his last words and then it tells us in verses 50 and 51 that when Jesus died, now the timing is important, when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple, the one that we've been talking about that separated the holy place from the most holy place, was torn in hand from top to bottom. This was not done by the hand of any man. No man would have dared to do such a thing. Instead, it was done by the hand of God to send a message to the people of that place and time and also to us that the old covenant, the old agreement is nullified. It is completed. It is no longer in force in its particulars. It is done from top to bottom. Why do you think the gospel writers made that point so plain? Completely. No top to bottom. The old system of separation was obsolete, and the new system of access to God was instituted by the death of Jesus. It provides us access to God. Access to God by removing the barrier. And as is written here in Hebrews, that the curtain that has once signified our separation is now torn and a new way opened. And when Paul writes to the Hebrews, he says, it's a new and living way. It's Jesus who is alive forever. His death was the means of tearing the curtain, but he's the one that stands at it now and holds it open for us and says, enter. To provide a way into the presence of God. The tearing of the curtain, and this is the third thing we need to learn, represents the removal of divisions. We'll go back to Hebrews now. It is the removal of revisions, or divisions, excuse me, regarding our relationship with God. What does Paul write in verse 22? He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere faith. God knows a sincere heart when he sees one. Let us draw near to him with full assurance of our faith. 
that we don't believe in vain, that our hope is secure, that we can relax. God's taken care of the important and left the details for us to work at. Eternal life is available. The second thing it means is that we can be forgiven, that we can be cleansed from all guilt, and that we can forgive ourselves as well. Notice what he writes there in verse 22, that our guilty conscience is wiped away. Our bodies are washed with pure water. That's a symbol of baptism, friends. And the acting out of God's grace to wash away our sins. It is also a symbol of the complete totality of God's forgiveness. All sin, all guilt, wiped away. Don't continue to act like a sinner. Act like a saint because you have been forgiven to the saint level. The third thing it means to draw near to God is that we receive hope. And hope, as the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 6, verse 19, is an anchor for our souls. What does an anchor do, you sailors? Go ahead. Keeps your boat in place. Keeps your boat in place. Exactly. So when the storms of life come and you don't want to be carried along with them, what do you throw off the side of the boat? Not your first mate. We can encourage with our words. We can encourage. 
encouraged with our actions. It doesn't matter how we do it. But the maturing Christian life should be characterized as being positive, as being optimistic, as being gracious. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian. We've observed that. But it, you can't be a Christian without being in church. And so this verse, which, because you're here today, you really don't need to hear it. You're here. So what you need to do today is make this verse portable and take it with you and share it with someone who isn't here. And look at verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. Oh, I can worship Jesus with a fish pole in my hands. Or, you know, God's at the mall too. Yeah, those things are true. But the fact of the matter is, is this passage affirms we need each other to be the people of God. There's no such thing as a solitary Christian. It's a group experience. We need one another. And you can't spur anybody if you don't know them. You probably shouldn't. And it's hard to know how to encourage them if you don't know them. And so the only way we're going to be able to love one another and build relationships in the way that Jesus died to provide us is to spend some time together. Which, by the way, is also a handy excuse for having longer sermons. But finally, notice what Paul writes here. All of this, all the more, as you see the day approaching. People say, I think we're in the end times. Well, folks, that, that means we need to step up our game, right? We need to be more intentional as we see the day approaching. We need to intensify our efforts. We need to get the name of Jesus into our homes and into our community, more so, not less so. Now to conclude, I want to explain to you the significance of the cherubim, the angelic beings on the curtain. And I'm going to quote um, briefly a sermon entitled, The Message Sown Into the Veil. A pastor named James Gross uh, made an inspired insight that I want to share with you this morning. He wrote, What is the message in the cherubims embroidered in the veil that ripped when Christ died? We saw so much of, in the Word of God about the tabernacle, so much in uh, how it ties with the Garden of Eden, and how the whole plan of salvation is getting back to the Garden again. Notice that cherubims were sewn into the veil, the barrier that stood before the holiest of holies. And we find that this veil ripped open when Jesus Christ died. The barrier was removed. And of course, this lines up with access to the tree of life in Genesis. Genesis 3.24 says, So he drove out the man, Adam, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. So the cherubims embroidered on the curtain were there as a reminder and as a symbol that you can come in. Those same cherubim who guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden stood guard at the Holy of Holies and said in their silent testimony to anyone who came, do not enter. They were the guards, they were the sentries, but when Jesus Christ died, that curtain was torn in two and the cherubim were set aside. The guards were told that they are off duty and that the access, the way to God, and, and the way back to the tree of life has now been open. God commanded that there be charity on that curtain. Because he knew one day it would be torn in half. And that he wanted us to know 
that the new and living way works. There are no guards there. We are free to walk in and see the light. Today, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if that life is not a part of your life, I want to invite you as we sing this last hymn to come forward. Let us pray with you to receive Jesus as Savior. Take your first step through that open prayer. Please turn in your songbooks to number 416.